This week on another live episode of Steve and Friends, we have an up-and-coming rising star in the field of MMT. It's Douglas, the MMT Macro Trader. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of Steve and Friends. We have a very special guest today, Douglas, the MMT macro trader. Now, I'm, I've am i been hesitant on making this a show about MMT each week, but I think it's important to cover the topic. So we had Steve Grumbine last week as kind of the showboater of MMT, really putting it out there to the masses. This week, we're going to have a very technical individual and Douglas who's doing a lot of research on exploring is the the MMT statements that are made is there some statistical evidence that can verify it can we create models to predict the future with MMT we're going to let him talk about that a lot more and then in a month I'm not going to say who it is but we have a very very prominent academic uh, from the field of MMT that I'm looking forward to having on as well. Um, I'll bring on Dan first just to say hello. Maybe he's got some interesting things to say this week to start the show. Well, I mean, the biggest question that I have uh, for Douglas is is going to be about the uh, the nature of the buy sell um, in 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 financial markets and whether or not the influence of MMT has anything fundamentally that changes that paradigm. And that that's what I'm I'm really curious about. Interesting. Uh, I'll take a moment. Uh, We're going to do this each week as we're going to kind of acknowledge our top chatter. So last week, I'll just run them off because they come here each week and I I love seeing them. We have Ghost on the Half Shelf. Thank you. Botched Mandela, Kami John, uh, Wesley uh, Wales, uh, Lana Dell hates the clock. And I'm glad Lana was actually in for the chat last week. Mark Fabian, Web Freaks, uh, Greg Roast. Ogham the Bold and Man in a Pit. Oh, these are some great names. Um, so um, I appreciate you guys uh, being on. And in fact, I've made a little ticker for for all the individuals here. Let's see if I can bring that up. Look at that. We'll leave that up for a little bit so people can take a look at it. Um, what else do we got to go through? Housekeeping. Hit the like button. Make sure you're hitting the like bucket button make sure you subscribe if you see us on twitter hit the retweet button hit the like button then come over here and chat you know join the show Uh, right beside um daniel's head there is our little chat phone there you go buddy that it was the weirdest hand i've ever seen (laughs) uh well we'll keep the trend of we are now the number one heterodox economic live stream on the internet um now, the, the, the field isn't very crowded, but remember I said live stream. We are technically the most popular heterodox economic live stream. Uh, we're growing each week, um, so let's keep that line going up. That's no reflection on the guests um, that we have. It's actually a reflection of me running the show properly, which I failed in the, the very beginning because I'm not a good podcaster. Um, oh, we're going to bring on the man, Steve Keen now. Steve, how you doing? Hi, guys. Pardon my shaving accident uh, down here. Hang on, that's, that's the wrong side. <laughs> I can't. I'm even worse than you, Dan, on the hand gestures. There it is. No, but I like how you use I love how you use the middle finger. That's Sorry? pointed out. That's, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that says to me. Okay, a career, a career of doing this to economic theory. Yes, that's then right. I, I use it yes. in my face gestures as well. Yeah, so I've got to, I've got to sharpen my shaver. But look what I did to my face. I might be blunt, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, luckily, your resolution's a little bit poor, so we can, we can't notice. Good. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's a, that's a good thing. I think that's like an automatic algorithm with restream. Um, if you have a poor looking face in the morning. It adjusts 
and it to help it you out. out. Yeah, yeah. It just it does that. Yeah, it's a filter. Yeah. So your 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 five o'clock shadow comes through fine, and my shaving accident from seven o'clock this morning doesn't it doesn't appear. Okay. You know what's you know what's funny? Like I can't grow as fast on the side. Like I grow this <laughs> na naturally perfect goatee, and like it's in yeah. by you know it's in by like twelve o'clock at noon. It's there, right? But on the side. It's like three days before it's there. I, I don't know. Weird Irish yeah, genetics. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, 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 I, I sympathize because I actually had a beard in my 20s and my, my, my girlfriend at the time nicknamed me Redbeard. It, was, it relates to both a, a famous pirate and also an Australian, um, uh, what they call bush ranger. And, uh, and the reason I grew it is because the previous girlfriend came along to a, a conference that I was, or actually a debate I was in, a, like a university debate, and woke up the next morning with her with not having shaved for a couple of days. She said, oh, Stevie, which I hated, uh, grow a beard. And the only reason I did was there was a guy in the audience who's me with a beard, a full-faced beard. I thought, right, okay, I'll grow a beard. And same bloody problem you've got. There was holes here, holes here, you know. So this genetics was against me. So, uh, you know, we've got a pretty full-faced beard there in Daniel. So uh, I've long since given up on the on the beard. But it's obviously I'm not doing too well on the shaving. Yeah, it's 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 the philosopher in me. I think I need something to pull on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll okay. just use this. <laughs> okay, so yeah. this is a perfect segue uh, since we have full beards on Dan. Our guest, Douglas, the MMT macro trader, has a full beard. And here he is. <laughs> Howdy, guys. Uh -huh. Coming into a beard conversation, huh? Yeah. <laughs> How are you uh, doing, Douglas? You yeah. said, friend, we, we, we may or may not have drunken substances before the show starts. Uh. Really hard to <laughs> and these guys are doing morning in Vancouver. So uh, if they're having drinks over there, we're in real trouble. <laughs> you look like the chairman of the beard there, Fred. There, Fred. Chairman of the beard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Douglas, um, Douglas, how are you doing? Yeah, doing good, doing good. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's an honor to be on. As I was saying before we got going, I've, I've listened to, to to numerous hours of, of Steve Keen lectures and uh, presentations, and to be able to get to talk to the man himself for a little while is uh, is quite the honor. And yeah, thanks for inviting me. Cool. So let's let's before we um, link up the connection between Steve and Douglas, the MMT macro trader, um, which is my last name, by the way, that's actually my last name. Some people think that uh, that I just took that moniker on uh, to promote MMT or something. Uh, that, is, that is my last name uh, for the record. Yes, I've actually seen <laughs> the MMT I've, trader. Yeah, your parents are yeah, very precious. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've seen so you're, the actually, you're only 25. You're only 25 years old because you're born after Warren Mosler. Correct. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's, exactly, yep. that's exactly what it was. Yeah. My parents were okay, reading so uh, Warren Mosler in high school. And, make it, yeah, yeah. 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 That's how it all go. played okay. out. <laughs> okay. I'll believe you and you can show me the Boston Bridge later. <laughs> So let's um, let's talk about the work that you're doing right now. Um, so I might get the, some of the terminology wrong. Yeah, you're yeah. Using yeah. Uh, Granger um, statistical analysis to look at some of the different variables in MMT. Can you walk me through the entire process of the model? Um, take as much time as you want because yeah, I think that's yeah. very fascinating stuff. All right. First things first. Uh, if you're not if you're not following me on Twitter, uh, pull up to Twitter. It's at MMT Macro Trader, my last name. Um, and and so some of the some of the posts uh, recently that I've done ha have been some of this research uh, that that I've been piecing together. And and then to take a step uh, just a, a step back to kind of get the context here. One of the questions I had um, is, is 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 someone who's into finance, someone who's into investing, someone who's into uh, trying to use whether it be heterodox economics understanding, which which is core to what I'm doing as well. MMT, the whole framework. Um, is there is there really anything in the data uh, that you can use to exploit markets effectively? I mean, is there anything that markets haven't figured out yet uh, that you can use to exploit? And one of the one of the theories I've long wanted to kind of push into is. Can we use deep learning, uh, deep learning neural networks to take the kind of core MMT heterodox data set and mm -hmm. predict something, right? Whether it be unemployment, whether it be stock prices, whether it be inflation, right? Is there anything in the data that we can predict out into the future using just 
kind of core data? And I think if, if the answer turns out to be yes, then that's, I mean, that's a good thing in and of itself. Um, and then we can continue to push forward and figure out you know, what the next step is. And so this has kind of been the project uh, that, I've been, uh, that I've been on for quite a while now uh, to really get into this. I've already built some uh, really fascinating models using, uh, using uh, 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 kind of a Bayes theorem approach, really effective. They've played out well. Um, I'm happy with it, but I want to keep pushing uh, further and farther. And so, uh, about six months ago, I brought on uh, a buddy of mine, Bijou Smith, to work with me, and and he's got a background in Python and, and has a, a PhD in physics. So he's he's got the he's got the the deep know how to to make sure that uh, as I as I build this uh, parachute to jump off the cliff and uh, test it out, that you know it's probably going to work, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to have a a, a soft landing, if you will. Um, so that's that's a that's the background. And then what I did. I, one of the things you have to do when you build deep learning models is you you have to uh, essentially uh, validate what are called the features. So the features are your data set that you're going to put into a, a deep learning model. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that, one, there's just a basic correlation with the data and what it is you're trying to predict. And then you want to dig even deeper. Um, so you want to see, is there a nonlinear relationship, right? And that's something, uh, a tool like mutual information you might use uh, to calculate that out over various uh, features. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to make sure, okay, is there forecastability? Uh, and this is where uh, the Granger causality test comes in. And pretty much it's just looking at, I mean, if you have two graphs, once you uh, once you make them both stationary, if you have two graphs laid on top of each other, let's just say government spending and inflation, and they're laid on top of each other, well, then you can just see with your eye, right, you know, does government spending lead inflation at all? And then Granger causality is a statistical test to see if, in fact, there is something. As it turns out, over the last 40 years, government spending doesn't lead inflation. It seems as though it's really a supply-side phenomenon, at least when it comes to Granger, uh, Granger causality and, and kind of the forecastability of something like inflation. That was one of the tweets I had out and some of the research that I put out. But once you finally get all your features, you have some reason to believe that that's going to have some sort of forecastability of something forward-looking. Then you can finally build your deep learning models. Uh, the idea, again, was not to build a model that would be perfect for predicting anything per se at this point. Uh, the work that I did uh, that I posted recently and shared recently was specifically to predict unemployment because that's just, I mean, that's just fun. It's something the, the MMT heterodox world you know, you would, like to, would like to see. And I use just core sectoral balance data. Data in this uh, in this model that I put together, it's it's called a LSTM, a, a long short term memory a recurrent neural network. Uh, that's a neural, neural network uh, deep learning model that's perfect for finding uh, finding uh, some sort of uh, predictability in nonlinear data. That's that's kind of what they're that's kind of what they're they're meant for. They're really good at handling kind of complex dynamic style data. So we piece all of that together. And, uh, and again, the idea is, can this thing learn at all, right? I mean, it, we, we have a robust enough model. Can it learn? And it did. I mean, that's exactly what it was able to do. Yeah, we found this thing. Uh, Ty, I think you had the screenshot. If, I mean, if you want to toss that up real quick. It was able to learn. It was able to take core sectoral balance data. That would be the, the only three data points were, well, really, te technically, it was four that I put in there. Uh, but it was going to be the first one was uh, government spending. The second one was bank credit. And then the final one was current account or net exports. And uh, that's all the data that we gave it. And then I also had a, a CPI, uh, a real uh, adjusted uh, version of each one of those. And then some derivatives, the, the percent change over a year, the acceleration. So um, there ended up being I mean, some ways that we kind of, you know, help the model learn a little bit ahead of time. And so what you see on the chart is the stuff to the left is the validation and testing data. The stuff to the right is the training data. So the stuff on the right, it has the answer in the back of the book. So it better look perfect on the right side. Otherwise, the model's just broken. But the stuff on the left side of that chart is uh, it, it's just the model guessing. I mean, it's the model learning what it learned during the training and saying, this is where I think unemployment is going to be. Now, again, I we in, in one sense, we suffocated this model with as little data as possible, right? We constrained this model because what we wanted to see is, could we get any learning out of it? And we could. It was able to look at the data. It was able to understand some of the things that Steve Keen has put together over the years, some of the things that guys like Warren, Moller, Warren Mosler have put together over the years, learn those principles and get some sense of a prediction out based on just those core sectoral balance flows, um, which validates multiple things for us, right? I mean, it validates that there's actually something in this data worth looking at. Deep learning models can learn it, learn from it. And now it's, you know, off to the races. How much more can we, you know, can we put on this thing and how much more can we predict? Obviously, if I wanted a perfect model, 
to predict unemployment, I would have added you know, quite a few other features than just the core uh, sectoral balance data. But the idea was, can we validate that there's something in that sectoral balance data? And uh, we absolutely did. And then if you go down that Twitter thread as well, one of the things you'll see too, is I have what, what's called my, my, my noise data set, which is just a handful of uh, weather uh, data that I mm -hmm. have for, for local weather, a handful of weather data, I have like population data, some things that really shouldn't have a uh, terrible correlation with unemployment at all. Uh, maybe pop population might have a little, but it's not going to learn much from that. So I have a kind of a noise data set uh, that I ran on the exact same model, same parameters, everything set up the same. And it's a straight, I mean, it's effectively a straight line, right? I mean, it, it kind of wiggles a little bit, but there's there's yeah, zero that's... correlation. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, cut on I just wanted to interrupt because I had, I think, a really good question uh, about about validation of your previous re research. Yeah. So it's, um, it's Bayesian by origin, right? I guess by <coughs> design. Okay. The so, first model was, yeah, one of the first models I built. Yep, yep. Okay. So... Uh, your findings is it is it um, like uh, based in probability like an eighty nine percent chance that this you know fits this you know this trend line or how how what is the, okay what was your definition of validity right is it okay so yeah. the deep the deep learning models are not a Bayes based model the 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 models that I start out with uh, that I put together years ago were Bayes based and they were really just a naive Bayes uh, you know I have four quantiles that the market so what it's doing is just saying where is the Ford market price 30 days from now over history, right? What is the Ford return 30 days from now? And then it's going to look at the Gaussian distribution of, you know, a handful of data series. Most of it is, is kind of sectoral balance data and then some other finance data thrown in this thing. And then just say, hey, given this data, where are Ford returns over the, the history of the data set? And given the data we have today, where where would that you know where would the prediction be um, out, of, out of the four quantiles of uh, forward returns? Um, so that, that was the Bayes model. It's worked out so, fabulously. So, I mean, let me, yeah. Let me yeah. ask a question there because this is really fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at that point, is it like a moving average? And uh, it's just then, a, well, this way, oh, go ahead. a moving yep, average yep. combined with a, a bell curve distribution, right? I mean, I think Gaussian, I think of bell curve yep. distribution. Yep. And, so do you lattice in or put other distribution curves in, in that assessment when you do your analysis or build your program? Um, for the for the base system, it's a naive base system. Once it's set, it's set. I'm not I'm not adding anything in. Uh, it it just uh, it how do how do I explain this? Um, it, it just it it has kind of the training data set, which is you know all, all the data that it has, and then it just sets the four the four quantile uh, forward returns. And mm -hmm. if, I mean, essentially what it's doing is it's just creating a, a, an objective measure for me to, to not overweigh government spending, right? I mean, let's, let's oh, say it was a big, yeah. right? Let's say it was a big, a big shoot higher in government spending. I might say, oh, this is absolutely going to be it. Or I see something like uh, margin data really taking off, right? Um, and I might, you know, I, I might get excited to, to, to get to the long side or the short side on that. This is just weighing everything equally and saying, Given the data that you've given me, um, what it, is it the gives like? You your base, it gives your baseline, right? Yeah. So, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry, go ahead and keep going. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I, the final thing going back to the deep learning models is we, we gave it my noise data and it found nothing, right? So, I mean, we have a model that's robust and the, the noise data learned. It just didn't learn anything, right? I mean, so we were able to validate that these deep learning models learn. There's just nothing there to learn. Um, and the prediction was effectively a sideways line. And, uh, and, and so, I mean... I, it, it excites me to know that there's something in the data, right? I mean, the things that, that uh, you know, Steve, that you've been saying for years mm. and the, you know, the overlays that you've shown, the correlation that you've seen, deep learning models are seeing the exact same thing and they're, they're able to create some sort of prediction from it. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're continuing to push forward uh, even, even earlier this week. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm taking the next step to kind of build this thing bigger and better. Um, I have some other ideas that I want to try. If, if anyone is watching and they're familiar with uh, kind of the deep learning world, um, uh, there's a paper out that uh, maybe for kind of the best time series analysis, doing a convolutional layer that then feeds into an LSTM layer uh, that then creates the uh, kind of linear regression is uh, is maybe the best way. So we've been messing around with that. But um, at, at this point, I, I've ran numerous tests and have yet to run into anything that's like, hey, hey guys, this MMT stuff, this heterodox stuff, you know, d deep learning's not seen anything in these models. And then I would go, you know, a different direction and see what else is out there. But at this point, everything mm -hmm. continues to, to come back as, uh, yeah, 
that there's something here and um, and the best tools we have to learn from this data uh, can you know can see what what you guys have been pointing out now for years. And I think it's it just, it's fun. I, I, I hope um, some academic, I hope maybe some grad student uh, can run across some of this stuff one day and, and really take it and give it the the time it deserves to, to take. Uh, it, it's kind of a novel approach, right? Most people use deep learning uh, just to, you know, constantly want to predict something. I want to use deep learning to see, okay, well, is there anything, you know, is there any, is there any juice in this, uh, in this fruit here uh, to squeeze out? And, uh, and I think that would be a, a good way to, you know, to use these new kind of AI deep learning tools um, that, that really are, are very accessible to, to, to try and understand uh, some of this stuff. So, um, well, I already know the answer to this question, but I think it's worth addressing. Do these <laughs> models account for fraud, regulatory capture, and international clout and di di diplomacy? Are social considerations somehow assumed for each? Can you speak on that, Douglas? <laughs> yeah, so at this point, uh, we have no way of, of putting those inputs in. And, and I mean, it's a, it's uh -huh. a good question, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, this, this uh, you know, what, one of the difficulties I had actually in creating the, uh, the unemployment model is we had this thing called COVID hit and it created you know 15 percent unemployment here in the u.s right I, there's no way you can predict an asteroid hitting i mean you can predict an asteroid hitting but you get what i'm saying i mean an asteroid could hit tomorrow and unemployment would be very high right um <laughs> so yeah, yeah i mean there's, there's, there's a lot of things I, th look there are ways you can create models to understand and, and allow for some of those uncertainties to come in um and some of that stuff is baked into the the cycles that that kind of uh, you know, you know happen, right? At the end of the day, the economy that we have and the way it plays out is you know fifty percent policy and then fifty percent the dynamics playing out, right? I mean, the policy is going to set the dynamics that can play out. It's going to set the boundaries for where the dynamics can go. and uh, and and so th there are ways that we've we've dreamt of that we can maybe get those policy dynamics in. But as anyone who's kind of played around with any of these different ideas, um, the policy can change at any time and and then you kind of have to find a way to to get your model to to adjust for that policy. How do you um, take this into making trading signals? How do you actually, are you going to develop it for your surname? Yeah, 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 my last name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so the idea, I mean, really the idea is, with the Bayes model right now, I mean, if, if, if the flows are strong, if we're seeing... I, Really, actually, I, let me back up and kind of give you some of the things that I've, I've noticed and some of the things that I learned from you, Steve, years ago. Yeah. The price of the S&P is really two things. I, it's like 90% of the price can be understood uh, based on two things. The, the, the trend, so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of uh, decomposition, seasonal decomposition of a, of a data series. So you remove the trend, you remove the seasonality, and then you're left with some sort of residual. There's a common uh, common tool used when you're doing uh, deep learning to, to prepare your, your features that you're going to uh, feed into the model. If you run that on the S&P, the, the trend that, that emerges is almost identical to um, the national debt over time. And then the seasonality seems to be, as far as I can tell, I'm, I'm, it's hard to see, but it seems to be the seasonality of the government spending. And then the residual overlays quite well with the, uh, with the uh, uh, credit cycle. Um, so it's really government spending plus the credit cycle that determines the majority of, uh, and I think, Steve, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you would absolutely, uh, you, yeah, I see you shaking your head. I'm sure this is things that you've uh, figured out and, uh, and seen. And so, you know, there's obviously a lot of noise and COVID hits and that drops the market 20, 30 percent in, in a month, but then bam, we're right back up because why? I mean, government spending strong and it didn't destroy the credit cycle. Um, so, so you, you end up seeing that. So, what we do is then we just kind of take the derivatives of this, and, and again, you've you've seen this, and I learned this from you, right? You take the you take the percent change, or you take the yeah. acceleration, and these things give you a little bit of heads up of where things are headed. And this is kind of the fascinating thing. And, and when Bijou joined up, he, he really kind of solidified this in, in language that was helpful to me, or at least framing that was helpful to me. You know, the vast majority of the world, if you go find uh, the vast majority of the finance world, if you go find out what they're really doing with finance, you know, the quants, they're really doing statistics. I mean, they're really doing statistics. Yeah at a deep level. What I'm doing is not statistics. What I'm doing is more akin to physics, right? I'm trying to understand yeah. what are the underlying, what are the what underlying drives us to start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that's kind of, I mean, Steve, you know, I mean, I, you know, this is, <laughs> this is stuff I know you're already aware of because you're doing physics, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I, physics with air quotes, right? I mean, obviously you're not doing physics, mm -hmm. but it's, it's far more akin to physics than it is to statistics. And I just don't think the finance world is up to, the, the finance world has no, Unless it's a, a, a some sort of fund that is completely private, no one knows about it. They have no 
they have no reason to, to dive into this because they, they sell their funds to other people and the whole world, the whole finance world speaks statistics. They don't speak physics yet. And so mm. I'm sure there's people that have figured some of this stuff out, but they're not going to open their mouths about it. They have no incentive to open their mouths about it. It's the people that want to mm. sell their fund to the next person who's going to speak in statistics language. And I just don't see this priced in, um, you know, these sort of insights priced in at this point. Well, I think which means you can make a profit out of the out of the gap between the actual price. And that's, the yeah, yeah. Are. I mean, that's yeah. I think these are insights that are um, yeah that have what what the finance world calls alpha, right? I mean, I think yeah. consistently you can you can uh, squeeze a little alpha out of it. And just yeah. for the record, not a ton of alpha. I, I just I, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying you can make you know fifty thousand dollars a day and buy options. I mean, this is just this is squeezing a little bit of alpha out of something that hasn't been fully incorporated in in, in the finance world. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so where do you where do you hope to go with uh, with, with future research? Like, is your goal mm -hmm. to have something that's like um, a little bit tighter in the prediction? Um, yeah, yep. something that I mean, I kind of the way I, you're describing this, it's it's very interesting. It's like a scalpel, or it's the crowbar to kind of open this and transform it into into a movement or something that does what Steve hopes can happen, which is uh, initiate a paradigm shift. Right, because we are running in kind of like two parallel sort of competing uh, worlds here, right? Yep. And how do you shift them? Well, I mean, according to Max Planck, we got to wait for all of us to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then future generations will do that. But uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts? So going forward, in terms of kind of what we're, we're continuing, one, I, I mean, we, we already have great tools. I've already put together a great tool set. We can make it stronger. Um, once the AI models and once the deep learning models consistently can outperform and I can really understand that, that they're better than the Bayes models that I've already built, we just we just turn them, you know, turn them over. And and that's just kind of what I use going forward. Um, Let's see. I, I've got two pieces that I want to bring up. I'm trying to think of which way I do this. Okay, let, let's talk more about you know how do we change minds and that sort of thing. It, that's also really important to me too. Uh, it, look, if if I'm if I'm right and I succeed, I end up undercutting myself. Right? Everyone figures this out, and hopefully um, we're all better off for it. I, I think a lot of like the passive investing, people throwing money right in the S and P, the 401k system that's here in the U.S. I mean, I, I think all of that stuff is very troublesome for society. I, I don't I don't think it's a it's a good thing for society per se that everyone just throws 10% of their monthly income right into the S&P and that's just that, right? I think there are a lot better ways that we could structure society uh, than doing something like that. I, I love stock trading, I love understanding stocks, but you know what I'm doing is exploiting a huge uh, a huge oversight of the finance world or at least attempting to do. Um, and, and so, so there's that aspect to it, and I'm I'm glad to do it because I think we'll have a better society because of it uh, if 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 some of this stuff gets figured out. And I think, as well, the finance world is uh, uniquely positioned to potentially admit that they're wrong. I mean, even some of the far right wing nut job <laughs> Austrian are acknowledging. You've are repeated asking, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> They're they're asking questions that are clearly aware that they might have something wrong. I mean, every once in a while, they say things uh, about government spending and and about you know the credit cycle that you know they they acknowledge to a certain extent that that bank lending is is not you know just handing off reserves to the person that wants the loan right that there's new money being created but then they can't piece yeah. it all together but at least some of them have to admit eventually that they're wrong because some of them want to make money by being right right I mean there's the yeah. grift yeah I mean fi finance is a world of grifters and in a world of highly competitive people the grifters don't <coughs> care if they make money uh, by being right they just care if they can get you know the next sucker next to them to buy their you know buy their whatever it is you know their investment product but then there's some of them that they're here to figure out how this works. And it's that group that eventually is going to have to say, hey, look, this this stuff that Steve Keen's been saying for, for 20 years now, this stuff that Warren Mosler's been saying for all this time, these, these guys are right uh, in what they're saying. And once that happens, here's the fun part. Once that happens, they're the ones that actually have the ear to the politicians, right? I mean, they're the ones that are going to have a self-interest to say, hey, look, you got to keep government spending up. Hey, look, you got to do something about the massive debt load uh, that's out there. You know, this is really the drag the on the economy. Yeah. yeah, the private debt load. Correct. Private debt load. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, that, I mean, you know, is that 10 years down the line? I don't know. I, I, I'm 
Look, look, I'm 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 hopeful because in 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 twenty in twenty twelve, let's go back to twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. People still thought we were going to be Greece. People still thought we were going to have hyperinflation because of QE. Yeah. You're not going to get anyone to say that they even said that back then, let alone say anything like that today. So I mean, there's been a paradigm shift, and I think we're on the way. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm more hopeful than not that that you know in the next ten years, some of the dumb things people are saying today uh, will will move along. So, all right. Yeah. So no, uh, because getting getting out to economic theory as opposed to a practice people in finance market is an entirely different challenge. They'll resist reality to the end. So we'll we'll move actually kind of move the conversation along to the connection between Douglas, how Douglas found Steve uh, in the past, and we'll get kind of Steve's opinion on Douglas and get into the <laughs> juice of this. I'd like to say thank you for everybody that's watching the live stream right now. We really appreciate having you. Um, and Steve is going; he's disappearing into the <laughs> to the green. I want you to hit the like button. I want you to subscribe if you're watching on Twitter, retweet, like it, and then come over here, join the chat. We have our top chatters from last week. We appreciate you coming each week. Um, this live stream is not a live stream without you. So we really appreciate it. So we'll turn back here to Douglas. I want you to kind of go back in time and I want you, I kind of want to because this, this relates heavily to me and how I found Steve. So it's interesting to me how other people have found Steve. Describe to me how that happened. Did you see a YouTube video, mm -hmm. an interview? How did that work out? So uh, I used to be one of those far right winger uh, Austrian types. And I, I had, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, but, but I had a good buddy. I had a good buddy who kept kind of pressing me. He's kind of socialist Marxist type, but he, he'd press me. And I actually do. I, I, I have a vague memory, even before I, I kind of found MMT first, but I have a vague memory that, uh, one of, that he handed me one of your Forbes articles before everything finally clicked. And I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. And so I just kind of, you know, sorry, I put it in the recycling bin at the time. But this probably would have been 2014, 15 range, maybe. Maybe maybe okay, right around that. Yeah. I think you might have been writing for Forbes at that time. Uh, but then then eventually the MMT stuff clicked, and uh, so I started talking to this buddy of mine, and he he knew I was into finance trading and really wanted to figure out that as aspect of it. And he's like, "Hey man, there's this Australian guy you got to check out. Uh, he's he's got some crazy ideas about cycles and about you know what really caused the the great financial crisis." And that's when I found some of your your. Uh, presentations that you did or some of the lectures that you did. I think this is right when you were switching between QED and Minsky. I think Minsky was oh, just right. being okay. developed. Yeah. Yep. So it's yeah. about that time frame. At least that's when I was running across some of it. Uh, and, and you had some kind of debt. I think one of them was debt deflation. And you were explaining some of the stuff. And I'm like, holy cow, I, I think this guy's right. I mean, I, I think this is exactly how it played out. And then uh, and then I run off to the, uh, you, know, you know, go gather the data uh, and see if some of the things you're saying, which is why I'm actually, I'm, I'm proudly uh, wearing my, my Fred. I saw that. Uh, yeah, St. Fred Louis Fred. Yeah, 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 right. Um, uh, yeah, listen, the people who run the Fred are great people. The people who are making the policy are idiots. But I'm sure the people who are running the Fred <laughs> are great are great people. And uh, uh, I have tons of data over there. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that um, uh, it's all, all, all that's there. And so I started piecing this stuff together and, and doing the work that you know I'm still doing to this day, the uh, kind of digging into it. And uh, and it all starts lining up. And I'm like, holy cow, I, I think this is where the oversight is uh, for the finance world. And I think there's you know there's something to be learned there. So I, I, I dug into, really, I, I mean, I call myself the MMT trader. I would call myself the heterodox trader. I don't think anyone knows what heterodox is beyond the heterodox economic <laughs> economists that are heterodox. Um, but really, I, I, I mean, I see both the credit cycle and it's not a cycle, but the government, you know, the, the understanding of government spending is is two sides to really what are determining price. Um, and those those are the two, uh, you know, the two pipelines that get fed into uh, the noise machine then, which is the market. So, um, yeah, the, yeah, the whole debt deflation stuff, the whole debt cycle thing, uh, all of that made a ton of sense. And at every turn, you just kept seeing <laughs> everything Steve was saying in the data itself. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it turned out to be quite, uh, what seemed to be quite predictive uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of understanding where the economy might be headed and the markets as well. So that was, that was kind of my, my origin story. Mm. So you began with an Austrian background. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Mm. Really, and part of it was, I, I really, I, I'm like, look, th these Austrians are obviously right, right? Uh, 
And if they're right, then you should be able to have some understanding of where things are headed. And this was back, um, I, was, I finished up school right as the great financial crisis was hitting, and all the Austrians were explaining that we're going to have hyperinflation, right? That was going to be the outcome. You're going to have hyperinflation. Uh, the banks are going to start lending the reserves, and this is all, you know, and then, and then the, the government's never going to be able to pay off this debt, and it's all, you know, we're going to become Greece with Weimar Germany, with you know, Argentina, right? I mean, you know, throw, throw every country that's ever uh, ever gone to the crapper. That's what the, you know, the U.S. is going to become. And we become a disinflationary 10-year no-growth nation, I, the exact opposite of everything that anyone yep. uh, predicted. And, and I'm like, look, you guys just aren't, <laughs> you're, not, you're not predicting. That's when I saw a Warren Mosler debate with the, uh, with the Austrian guys and everything they were saying. I'm like, you know, look, You've got the, you know, you guys have the sequence right. You guys have the, um, you guys have the tools to explain this in language that I didn't exactly understand at the time was kind of a physics engineering language, right? I mean, it's scientific. You can test this stuff. You can have hypothesis. You can say, oh, look, you know, if 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 this is true, then this should show up in the data. And then you go dig in the data, and you see the data looks exactly like it should based on the hypothesis. And you never have to use a, well, it's not happening yet because there's this six <laughs> to 240 month time lag. And then, you know, then people have to believe it because they don't believe it. And that's why it's not, you know, I mean, all these cockamamie reasons why, um, why, you know, I mean, it's. So yeah. were, you, were you losing money following Austrian ideas before you realized the MMT and credit of, analysis? <laughs> I got purely lucky. We I, actually, I put all my money in gold. I mean, at the time, I just got married. We had a kid. I put all my money in gold uh, right around 2007, and we went to get our first house. I think around 2011, when gold uh, just happened to hit its top, and so I sold all my gold because you know, of course, every economic decision is really a wife telling you to do something. Um, so, <laughs> so we, so, <laughs> you know, I sell my gold, so I just happened to make money um, just out of purely uh, out of purely uh, uh, stupid uh, stupid luck. Um, I it, any trader will tell you. They've lost money uh, over the years trying to figure out anything. Unless you're just a passive trader, um, you've lost money. It took a while to, to, to really figure it out, but um, I've got a pretty good system down now. Again, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not trying to say I'm crushing things, but um, the, the last four years uh, I've certainly been able to uh, to see some times of, of massive outperformance when when kind of the stars align and we have some some strong data to predict one way or another uh, where things are going. Good to know. Okay, some details about the neural network. Um, you've got, you know, I'm, I've got some familiarity with designing them. Yeah. Lots of hidden layers. What are you using off the shelf? You're writing your own stuff in Python? Writing my own stuff in Python. We use uh, TensorFlow Keras to piece together okay. the model. Yep. Lots of hidden layers, lots of parameters. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, they, they, in the original day, they were uh, quite shallow, uh, the, the deep ones. How, just, just roughly, rough, how many hidden layers? Roughly. Um, this one had four hidden layers. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I can give you. It, it, there was a lot of fine tuning. I, I have a. I have a beast of a PC. I have a a, a, a video card that's you know fifteen hundred bucks that has fifteen thousand CUDA cores, so it has the ability to run these things. So, so I, calculations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I tried a huge model. Really, we ended up being able to fine tune the model to the parameters that were necessary for the data set that we were using. I think it had about 150,000 total parameters. Um, it had, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, layer one was 32 neurons. I think it went, I think it went 32, 64, 128, 128, and then off to the regression layer, which is, which is obviously just one neuron. Um, and then the other thing too. We threw in a ton of uh, what's called regularization, and what that means is, and I think I might have seen one of the one of the comments in here. I wanted to make for certain that this thing wasn't overfitting, and it, oh, yeah. It, it, okay. yeah. yep. And so we made sure we put in multiple safeguards to make sure this thing wasn't overfitting uh, to do the learning. And um, if, if you're unfamiliar with with overfitting uh, for for the for the viewers here, you know you know when you were in math class and there were the answers in the back of the book, but it only gave the uh, the even answers and you had to figure out the odd ones, right? Yeah, so you can kind of yeah, you can yeah, yeah you can kind of think of uh, deep learning as learning how to do the even problems that it has the answer for, and then guessing on the odd ones. But one of the things it can do, just kind of like you might have done in math class, is usually the problem after the even problem was an identical problem. They just switch a few numbers, right? So if you can, <laughs> if you can have enough savvy, you can just... You can you can still not figure out how to actually solve the problem, right? But you can get the right answer by just okay. kind of you know walking through it, right? So not a perfect analogy, but neural networks okay. can do the same thing, right? I, like in, I mean, in transfer space. functions, you got a range of yeah. transfer functions, or just logistics, or what are you using? 
Well, the final the final layer is essentially a, it's a it's a linear layer um, that is just a regression. I mean, it's doing a, essentially a regression based on the layers that are feeding okay. into it, um, which is I mean, that's you know, it's kind of the the, the heart of, of LSTM. The, the, um, the game plan is to eventually do uh, e- even like uh, l- various learning models um, that essentially it's the same models you would use to play like video to, to, to teach a, a system to play video games. Right. So, you know, yeah. we're going to pipe in a bunch of different models to this thing and it's called reinforcement learning. And then this thing's going to kind of learn how to take all the data that we're feeding into it to make the best decision on size and all that sort of stuff. Um but uh, going back to the neural network, yeah, we, we made sure it was as uh, as robust as possible to learn, and that it would learn, um, and and it was uh, yeah done in Python, Keras, uh, TensorFlow, which uh, we are going to make this just for record. We are going to make this all public in the future when we finally get okay, it all cleaned up. Then. I'm a terrible coder. Uh, I, I rely solely on AI and and uh, GitHub Copilot to do most of my coding for me. Um, it's messy. Bijou, my partner in crime, is a great coder. He's going to clean it up. Play how to we'll you, by the way. Okay, he's uh, he, he, he has actually joined my mastermind classes and yes, been, yes, a lot on Twitter. Yeah. So you say hello. Yeah, we'll do. We, I was going to try to get him on for the after show, but because of the t- he's in New Zealand, of course, uh, he he yeah. wants to go. He works at night and wants to go to sleep. So I think sometime in the future, it'd be nice to just bring him on when we have an open yeah. slot because he's a really intelligent individual. Yeah. So yeah, that's Bijo. Also, I'd like to welcome Josh, uh, WWE fan. I believe that's Josh, right, Douglas? Yep. yep. He, he is a watcher of the at MMT Macro Trader live stream, which you can find every Wednesday at 8 p.m. 8, 8 Eastern. p.m. Yep. 5 p.m. Pacific time and whatever else uh, in Europe, that would be really late at night. 2 o'clock in the morning. Forget it. 2 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) Oh, but it's worth staying up for. I'm certain of it. (laughs) It it is recorded, so you can can check out the live streams after. I'll just mention he was really lucky to achieve having Warren Mosler come on uh, three or two weeks ago. So check him out. Check him out. Uh, Douglas is getting some juice under his wings and he is really taking off and doing a lot of cool things uh we'll carry on steve what do you think of all of this work douglas is doing proving mmt well it's randomizing in 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 some ways buffett began the same sort of way if you go back to buffett's origins right back in the 70s i think um he was saying he was being told that you can't make money out of the stock market because all the future information is priced in and uh and, and Buffett's answer was, well, if that's true, I won't make any money. We made a fortune, as we all know. So in, in this sense, the one of the great advantages of the finance sector, even though I'm no great fan of finance taking over the real economy, you have people who are after making serious money. And if you have an analysis which is seriously ideological, they're going to lose money unless luck comes their way. So they sell gold at the right time. You know, your, your baby came along at the right time to sell your gold. <laughs> that sort of thing helps. And then they can take credit for having the baby at the right time. And that's actually why they made a profit out of the trade cycle. Uh, but but in a fundamental sense, you want to make it over 30 or 40 years, then you've got to have analysis, which is correct. And what I really want to see is uh, to get some capacity for the positive feedback from people in the finance sector about which there is, which work and which don't, to smash down the barriers in the academic world that stop any reality getting in there whatsoever. I don't know how you felt about it, but I was absolutely outraged when I saw Buddy Ben Bernanke get the Nobel Nobel Prize for his nonsense on on um, on, indog- on on loanable funds and all that sort of garbage. Um, so you know, reality doesn't crack the academic world, and this is one of the great problems. They'll continue producing people believe this delusional nonsense, uh, regardless of the fact that when they try to England the market, they get wiped out, and they've got to go become an academic instead. Yeah, maybe I'll end up as an academic. <laughs> um, Stick with your current lifestyle. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things too is, as I was really pressing into this, uh, the, the college that I went to was was very right wing, uh, very monetarist, very uh, uh, you know pro business. That's you know kind of how they how they uh, put themselves out there, and um, and, and so I, I never 
once I kind of stumbled upon, you know, kind of the heterodox MMT world, I just kind of <clears throat> stopped pushing into any of that. So I, 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 I sheepishly tell you that, you know, I, I couldn't set up a, a, a GS. Um, yes, yeah, I can't even remember the the acronym now. The General Stochastic Equilibrium Model. Um, oh, dynamics and just so yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I, general I, equilibrium. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you what I'm looking at, and part of my part of my thought on that is. Why do I want to learn uh, what epicycles are, right? I mean, how, why do I care, exactly. uh, right? I mean, what, what what is it going to gain me, um, at least in my endeavor at this point? I know some people need to learn that to tell them why they're wrong, to understand why they're wrong. But for the endeavor I had, I just quit listening to them, and I, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know. I it, whenever I see some some uh, some articles get posted or anything, I mean, you know, people start talking about the U.S. as the reserve currency of the world, or you know, you, you, you know, everything that's going to follow is going to be moderately incoherent, or you know, mm. whatever. If if you know, we're in this massive, like uh, I think uh, uh, the Doctor Doom uh, Robini's out there saying we're in this. Uh, you know, there's too much, you know, there's too much debt, but he can't differentiate between public and private debt when he makes this comment. Mm -hmm. And then everything after is just, I don't know what to make of it because I live in a world that has a completely different framework. And so a lot of that I've just moved, I've moved on and, and I kind of trusted your instincts out of the gate, Steve, to just, uh, you know, if I, if I really want to find the good stuff to not spend my time trying to think about, um, you know, what it is that, that, uh, you know, the policymakers are, are trying to, trying to track and really just go into the stuff that uh, actually has some sort of, uh, some sort of, you know, predictive power, consistent predictive power where I don't have to put the caveat that, you know, sometime between, uh, the next six months and the next 10 years, I might finally be right because I mean, we all get right after 10 years. So <laughs> Becky, uh, have you seen Blair Fix's recent work on the uh, inflation and how people, uh, you know, using lags and stuff like that end up uh, in begging autocorrelation comes and what they're getting is autocorrelation bias. So they're not getting actual lags at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Quite, quite beautiful work, I thought. I skimmed, I skimmed through it real quick. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think too, we can get into this too in the last 15 minutes. I'd, I'd love to get your take on it, but I, I'm in the camp that says higher interest rates are actually inflationary. Uh, they are actually going to drive the inflation. Um, because it does two things. One, it sets the price level, uh, price term structure higher, right? Uh, so, I mean, just imagine if you were to increase interest rates to, to 100%, right? Um, th that means then that every cost you're going to have next year, if, especially if you're a business and, and you need some line of debt to do it, is going to double, right? And the key is, is that now if, if we had reserve constraints, uh, that, that would uh, crush the economy at that point, but we don't. So the banks, I'm sorry, so the government is going to supply the necessary income to support that new higher term structure of prices. And I think we're seeing that play out. I mean, it's, it's wild to me that we're in this booming economy based on you know, common metrics. I'm not saying in, in the real world it's, it's booming for everybody, but we have you know, unemployment at 50, 60 year lows. We are seeing, uh, we're seeing every growth measure start to come back on, on board. And I think it's all this misunderstanding that the interest rate is actually going to de you know decrease growth i think it's just propelling uh growth higher and, and it's supplying the necessary new income because of those interest payments to support that higher that higher term structure prices and this has been my prediction for the last three four months that all of a sudden has been my 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 gag on on twitter is yeah better than expected seems to be every headline for the last uh, for the last six months no, the than thing which interest rates can do is that can crush asset prices and that's what I'm waiting on seeing because you've got people who've got debt servicing costs. Yeah. So like the, yep. the gov government interest payments actually boost the economy. This is the accounting point that uh, yep. mainstream is don't understand. They they think the interest payments are being borrowed from somewhere else. In fact, they're creating money for the finance sector. Anybody who owns bonds is getting an increased income stream out of government money creation to uh, provide that interest rate. But then, of course, the banks put their own markup on top of that, what they charge for mortgages. And you, got, you guys have fixed rates uh, in mortgages, which slows down how fast the reaction is. But when those fixed rates reach their time limit, <clears throat> then people are going to find their cost of carrying that debt rises dramatically and they'll be forced into negative credit. So it'll still turn up through the credit, credit channel. But the interest rate effect will have, in that sense, will have a deflationary impact at some point uh, when it gets transferred into a majority of both uh, mortgages and also margin debt. So I, I, here's a question for you on that front. If mm -hmm. the velocity of money, if the, you know, the time it takes for the money to go through the economy increases, right? Yeah. That supports the higher debt structure though, correct? Mm -hmm. if, if velocity kicks it, up, 
correct? Yeah, if you get you got to hire a number of number of monetary dollars out of the existing stock of you know, turnover of money. Yeah, okay. turnover yeah. money. Yeah. Okay. So here's what's interesting is if you overlay uh, the velocity of money, and you go to you go to go to Fred and you overlay the velocity of money, um, and then you overlay that with the interest rate, right? They correlate really well. I mean, it's it's they it correlate pretty darn strong. And again, this is me kind of hypothesizing. I haven't put you know, a ton of effort into this, but they do overlay very closely. And it makes sense to me that because of this term structure of prices, um, pushing things, pushing the, the price level higher, that, that increases the velocity of money, right? That it, it really is kind of that interest rate mechanism that sets the velocity of money. That's, that's why, you know, velocity of money crashed for 10 years while we had ZERP, and now it's starting to go back up again. And it makes me wonder if, and again, I don't know, I, I mean, my, my gut feeling is that you're right, but it makes me wonder if the velocity of money, the turnover of money in the economy, because essentially it's making money hot at that point, uh, can offset the potential uh, doom that might happen from you know, kind of essentially what you just explained that that, that eventually that, that debt servicing becomes a problem. I don't know. I mean, the good thing is we'll see it in the data, right? I mean, we'll see a deceleration of, of, of the credit demand. And eventually, if that happens, you know, it's not going to be fun, <laughs> obviously, as we know. But um, it does kind of make me wonder if there's something to that the velocity of money, the turnover of money gets propelled and can hold on to the debt cycle longer than I think anyone could expect. That's kind of my hypothesis that that's how it could play out. Um, that's, you know, that's just kind of my intuition, but uh, uh, might be worth looking at. I can send you those charts that, that I'm talking about. It's, it's If you're on the Fred, you just type in, uh, you just do the, uh, um, the rate of change, the percent change of like the 10-year yield and the percent change mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, the money velocity, and you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. If you're, if you're watching this at, at home and you want to pull that up on Fred, you can see that. Mm. I'd say probably acting through the level of private debt. This is the usual sort of story. I mean, uh, I think one reason velocity of money declined is because of the high level of private debt meant people were, they, they, what they were doing, they were hanging on to their money in the belief that they wanted to have more money to service their debt levels. Uh, because when you hang on to money, you slow down the velocity of money. You mm -hmm. don't actually increase the amount of money in the system. If you actually end up having more in your bank account, given the rate of change of money that already exists, there's going to be less in somebody else's bank account. And what you actually get out of it is a declining velocity of money. So we're seeing, I mean, velocity used to be 1.8. Roughly speaking, look at the uh, the MZM, which is my favorite measure of uh, yeah, the amount me of money, which the Fed's no longer maintaining. I agree. I agree. Yes. No, I agree. It's yeah. a big bummer. They discontinued that. Yeah, that, yeah. I agree. It used to be 1.8. Mm -hmm. I hit almost three during the inflationary peaks in the, the 70s. And it's now, when they stopped, then discontinued, we're down below one. Yep. So yep. what you got was, and that really correlates with the rising level of private debt. And I can see people making a, a decision, oh, I can't spend as much, I can't go shopping because I've got to service my debt, what it means is aggregate, the aggregate level of income falls uh, and and therefore the velocity of money is, comes out as falling as well. Yeah, I, it, it could be one. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I'm in no disagreement there per se. Uh, it does make me wonder though, if they're just, yeah, I'll send you the chart. I think there's some there, there's something there uh, worth digging mm -hmm. into in terms of the, the, the velocity of money and interest rates because the interest rates set the price level, set the, the term structure of prices that seems to be some propellant to the velocity of money. Because again, I mean, as interest rates go higher, there's going to be a desire to spend the money now as opposed to later, right? Um, that, in terms that, of people who are saving the income interest money, which would be your, your basically your financial sector and the bondholders. Fi financial sector, or even even people just have you know a normal day job, right? I mean, if, if, if their inclination is, uh, and especially in, in, a, in a scenario where you have kind of supply chain shortages, right? I mean, if uh, wow. you know, we, we were going on for a while, I, I, I like, <laughs> this is sound really stupid, I really like strawberries, so my wife and I used to buy me strawberries, and all of a sudden there was a strawberry shortage, right? Uh, that we had that we had up here, and so, uh, you know, if, if they're there, you're going to get them, right? And if, if there's mm -hmm. a hotness of the currency yeah, kind of like the Gessel currency, right? I mean, if, if, it's, if you know it's going to expire, uh, you need to get rid of it. And yeah. the term structure prices can force that, you know, can force your hand. There's a, there's a desire, there's a need to get rid of that currency faster and faster um, that yeah. I think might happen from higher interest rates. So I'd, I'd like to 
because we're getting close to the top of the hour here, I'd like to put Dan on the spot because I enjoy doing that. I enjoy watching the slight cringe on his face when I do this. Um, and I am sorry, uh, Mr. Sanderson. But what do you think of Douglas? Is this guy not fucking impressive? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I I, I kind of trying to imagine what your day-to-day -day circumstances are. And, and I... I I don't know what you do for a day job, but this seems like you've put a considerable amount of um, of time into well thought out, um, you know, time. It's not just a YouTube channel. You've got you know a body of research, and you know it's an ongoing sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's like it's great. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Cool. Thanks. If you can is disagree it, with me, I'd, I'd love a good fight. No, okay. is, is well, I do have some. I do. So I do. Yeah. Sorry. I, I do have a question that might be a, the the direction of a criticism. Okay. Perfect. I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> no, because but I don't know. I just I want to know what uh, have you have you read any of Nassim Taleb's hate? Yeah, on yeah, the market? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've. I've listened to his lectures. I, I haven't read his stuff. I, mean, I listened to his lectures. I get the gist. It's kind of funny. I kind of see myself as like the opposite of Nassim Taleb, right? Okay. I, yeah. My, my theory is Nassim Taleb is effectively is saying like, look, things are really chaotic, and if you make a, if you're willing to lose a little bit of money, uh, the, the 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 blow up is always bigger than people ever anticipate. And um, that's the way to do it. And in the meantime, you're not going to figure out, and you know, there's no other way to beat the market anyway. So, you know, bet big on, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, bet small over time. And then when that blow up happens, there's finally a big payout. My thought is, no, actually, there are periods of time where the future is very predictable, right? Again, I'm not saying you can predict an asteroid hitting tomorrow. I'm not saying you can predict uh, another global pi a pandemic. But um, to me, it was very obvious uh, through uh, you know the latter half of 2020 uh, into 2021 that we were going to be in a Goldilocks period of uh, of kind of uh, sustainability for I don't want to call it. I'll conflate economic growth with finance here, but at least the finance world, you know, we're going to see a lot of you know a lot of expansion there. Um, so I actually think that was highly predictable. And that's kind of what I'm, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's my underlying theory. I know there are a lot of people, and I mean, this is kind of the, the you know, the thing that, that went the, the Nassim Taleb route and, and uh, kind of made their bet that, that we were going to have, you know, some major crash and that they could, you know, eventually that it was going to be outsized and they could outside pay off, uh, mm -hmm. pay out from that. Um, but I kind of went the opposite way and said, you know, if the government just keeps spending and it, oh. and it offsets the risk of a major, you know, kind of debt deflation cycle, then in reality, markets can just keep going higher. And I, a ton of people made the bet that, that uh, Talib did after 2008, and it hasn't paid off. I mean, it just, maybe it will tomorrow. Maybe it will tomorrow. Maybe the, you know, there is some sort of, you know, chaotic outcome that, that none of us are seeing right now. And, and that was the way to go. But um, we've had you know, relatively strong government spending that has created a relatively stable credit cycle. And um, it's kind of well, my take. Steve, so, Steve um, yeah, predicted yeah. it too. Steve, why don't you uh, tell the audience about how how you were part of that that crew of people that actually predicted the the crash? And mine was um, I, I did my model on Minsky's financial instability hypothesis back in the early nineties, and so my focus is always on the role of credit and driving aggregate demand, and that actually set me apart from even post Keynesian economists because. And I remember having quite a few conversations and a long debate with, with, me with Mark Lavoie and Brett Feiberger, Tom Howley and a few others about the role of credit and aggregate demand. And because you have the identity of expenditure and income, there was a, a, a sort of unconscious thought that therefore credit couldn't play a role, even though we were all working on Minsky's hypothesis and so on. And I was at one with Michael Hudson and saying that, look, somehow the change in debt is part of aggregate demand. So I finally proved that mathematically in the uh, about 2015, I think, in that exchange in the review of Keynesian economics. I've got a mathematical proof that credit is part of aggregate demand and income. But of course, it turns up in the asset markets. So that's sort of the subsequent thing. When I was asked to do an expert witness report on uh, predatory lending in Australia in the mortgage market for one particular family that had been screwed by a mortgage lender, I uh, made the throwaway line that debt to GDP ratios, private debt, have been rising exponentially. And that has to break at some point when it does break, we'll have a downturn. 
and then I knew I couldn't rely upon hyperbole as an expert witness. I had to go and check the data. And what I got was a ridiculous correlation of the debt to GDP ratio, private debt to GDP ratio, with an exponential function. So I thought, well, I can't stick with the word exponential. It is exponential. When you get a correlation coefficient of 99.9957 with an exponential curve, you're entitled to call it exponential. Uh, and with that done, then I said, well, it can't continue. When it breaks, credit will turn negative. And when it turns negative, there'll be a downturn. And of course, you would have seen the data, Douglas. It's outrageously strong. We yep, went from yep. credit being 15% of GDP, uh, equivalent to the maximum level it ever reached in America in about 2006, down to minus five by 2009. So in effect, you had a 20% turnaround of GDP in credit-based demand because most of that credit went into asset markets. That was that was going to cause an asset market crash, which is what we saw. I, I wish I could have been there in real time as you ran across all this. It, it would have been. I mean, I can only. I, <laughs> I can wish only I had imagine. money to invest. I wish I had money to invest at the time. <laughs> I can only imagine some of the eureka moments you had, Steve. I, I got to tell you two two things on the way out. One, just just kind of for the chat. Um, I, I see this come up. L listen, everything I'm saying. I completely agree. Uh, the setup that we have in the U.S. in uh, globally in the West, uh, in terms of finance, in terms of the way economics is approached, in terms of um, how society integrates with an economic worldview, it needs to change. We need to see reform. We can all live better lives. In the meantime, yeah. uh, there are decisions that every one of us can make on an individual level that um, will benefit us, our families. And I, I am both someone who see something that can be exploited, and I don't feel bad at all for exploiting the finance sector. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, I also want to see a change as well, uh, because I, I don't want to live in a world of has and has not and have nots. Mm -hmm. I, I want to live in a world uh, where there's justice, uh, where there is equity or equitability across, uh, across classes, uh, oh, a classless world if we can get there. That's really what I want. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, I think the finance direction is important. So I've seen a few. Um, it's just going to create more inequality. No disagreement there. Um, it's not that I like the outcome of everything that I'm seeing. I, you know, if, if we keep heading in the right, the same direction, that that's a good thing. Uh, I hope some of this can lead to that change. But the final thing I wanted to say before I got to get taken off is uh, one of the one of the things we've been working on. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, this uh, set of packages program for uh, for Python uh, called Cindy. I forget the guy's name. I wish I had it. S I. ND and then the Y is, is not part of the name, but it's a sparse identification for nonlinear dynamics. And what it is, is it's a Minsky backwards, <laughs> effectively. Okay. So what it can do, it's, it's really fascinating, really taken off in like the fluid dynamics world. Uh, if you look it up on YouTube, there's a guy from, I think it's Washington University who, who released the research. But what you do is instead of building a Minsky model with differential equations that give you an outcome that you, know, you think you can observe in, 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 the, you know, in the real world, you take the real world data and you shove it into this Cindy, uh, this Cindy uh, uh, structure. And then it's a, kind of a, a learning model that then spits out the differential equation that you can then use, to, you know, to either plug into Minsky or make some other uh, make some other prediction with. So it's a it's a it's a it's an idea that's right up your alley, just the other way around. It's one of the things that's actually so I'm working what's on the deep. The, the, give me the what's the title? What's it called again? I haven't actually heard of it. S I N D Y with a, a lowercase -I. y. Um, the guy's name is Steve Brunton uh, on YouTube, and he has a sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. And um, it, it, it's that is actually what Bijou <laughs> is going to start to work on is the Cindy project because our our goal is uh, eventually again to get you know get a couple tools built here, get a couple models built. One that's this deep learning model, and then the other that's a Cindy model that can give us some sort of range of, of you know, future predictability using the differential equations as opposed to using kind of a deep learning approach. And then you, know, you point them both into a reinforcement learning model, and then hopefully uh, you can get a reinforcement learning model to kind of understand uh, where the per, you know where the where, where each edge might be on, on kind of the you know how high could things get how low could things get and then optimize you know some sort of trading strategy but the Cindy part is really fascinating and I think uh, would be a very valuable tool uh, for anyone uh, economics that has uh, heterodox MMT leaning perspective that understands that you know there's uh, again I, I use this in air quotes but it's it's more of a physics problem than a statistics problem and if they want to push into to that. I think Cindy's going to be some cutting edge, uh, cutting edge research, looking at that, you know, looking at that idea, and then you know, aiming that at 
whatever problem it might be, inflation, unemployment, whatever it is that you, know, you kind of want to solve. All right. Well, D- Douglas, um, this has been great. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. I've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot you, of fun as well. You are a natural teacher, you know. Um, you should. Act, I know Steve joke, don't ever get into academics. <laughs> But actually, I think you'd be well suited in it. So we really appreciate having you on. Steve uh, often goes through f- freezing issues. So it's not that he left at the end of the show. He's... No, I, I, well, I told him about Cindy and he's like, oh, my God, I got to get yeah. going on this right now. So he's already into the research, which is exactly what we want. Uh, yeah. Well, let's let's plug your show. It's Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Yep. Eastern time uh, on YouTube at MMT Macro trader or is it douglas what is yeah, if you the, type in nope if you type in mmt macro trader you will find me on youtube yep 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 perfect. same thing on twitter mmt macro trader follow me on twitter as well that's usually where i, I, I piece together i I've, I've had the best uh i've had the best engagement on twitter uh for some of the research stuff uh some of those fun engagement and i think the best reach to the to the you know the, the populace um so that's where i drop it first and then i do a video on youtube a week later or so that kind of summarizes it yeah cool All right, so we are going to go into the second half of the show. Douglas is going to leave. Steve will be right back um, to join us in the second half. Uh, Make sure you check out Douglas's show like we just talked about. You'll find me there in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always fun to have you in the chat, man. It's always fun to have you in the chat. Usually talking about Larry Summers um, because I'm a very very big fan of Larry Summers. Um, So anyways, we will do this again, Douglas, and we will see all the chatters in the next part of the show. Here we go. Um, we did it again. Now, as I said, our last show was canceled after you appeared on it. So, fingers crossed the executives don't do that again. The more I read in the New York High School thing, the more I just, you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I'm the okay. voice of God in the background. Oh, geez. <laughs> once, once the coins get uh, warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter, it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings. Well, that's inspiring for a Saturday morning. Still friends after the show. Uh, that was oh. great. Great to have Douglas on. It was. Um, I think. And I can actually say I finally met somebody who talks faster than I do. He, he is good. Actually, while you were gone, I actually told him, you know what, despite Steve joking around that uh, stay out of academics, you know what, people like him uh, would offer the world a lot and offer some real academics in academics. Oh, yeah. We, so. we need to get rid of I mean, I want, I, as I've said before, I think the most useful purpose uh, for a basic universal basic income we'd give it all the economists and get them out of the university to stop them wasting our students time in producing bullshit theories um, so if somebody like uh, Douglas could go into the finance into the academic and teach people uh, what actually happens in the real world that'd be a drastic improvement over the current situation so what I want, I want to do is I want uh, you and Daniel to kind of talk about Douglas and kind of branch off into your own conversation. My goal is on this show in the second half to slowly build up a Minsky model, um, but I don't want to have to talk necessarily at the same time I'm doing it. I want to run it in the background as okay. a screen, and I just I want you guys to just, you know, talk about whatever, whatever bullshit you guys want to talk about, right? Um, you know, Dan say some funny philosophy stuff about Plato or whatever. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. You know, Steve can go off on some neoclassical economists because that shit's really mm-hmm. entertaining. Okay. okay I got it. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Talk, so, Steve, I, I got something. I got, I got something yeah. about our, our guest. Okay. So okay. Um, we've, we've come to the, the conclusion that he would make a good teacher and he would be good for academia, right? He'd be good for our institutions of learning per se okay Mm -hmm. so we heard in the interview uh in today's episode that there's um a desire to make things 
more equitable across the board mm -hmm. um, to take away a class system, right? These kinds of this kind of language. Now, I'm not criticizing it. I'm just thinking how as an academic do you keep that um, objective, right? Because there was there was some there was some there was some I don't know what would we call that metaphysics or something in there, right? <laughs> So how do you keep that um, out of your out of your teaching to to students, right? Well, you've, you've got you're trying to do two things. You're trying to explain how the world works and make money at the same time. Um, and if you have have a, a commitment to a better society, then you can say what we've got right now is dysfunctional. So mm -hmm. that's in any way that's been Soros's situation throughout his life. I mean, he made a fortune. We we had a good talk, you know, as you know, with Rob Johnson. A couple of uh, weeks back, and Rob was the, the one of his right hand man in the in the uh, crashing the British pound. Now they didn't do it because they wanted to destroy the British economy. There was a huge operation opportunity that they saw as being uh, worth taking advantage of, and they did. But Soros has used his money since then, uh, a large part of it, to try to promote a, what he sees as a better society. My people might disagree with what, what he's done, but that's actually been a major motivation. So you can have the combination together. It's just, uh, you know, the hard part is actually making that money in the first instance. Mm, interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, just so that we kind of um, we follow Ty here, uh, what's he what is he building? Do you think this looks like my Goodwin model? Okay. Uh, by the look of these, he's dividing capital by output is going to have uh, okay, capital by output, capital output ratio is going to have output at the next entry. So this is the basic uh, uh, Minsky model. And uh, that's what I'll be, in fact, I'll be doing that for my own, the class that I'm giving, the mastermind class that I'm doing now uh, every Thursday, which is the thing you're getting somewhat annoying marketing from, from the marketing firm that's been organizing it for me. But that's, uh, the, the classes are going very well. So uh, what, what Ty is doing here without any, um, any explanation verbal from him is he's building the Goodwin model. And the next is going to be output, let's see. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the The problem with restream is it doesn't show all the um, windows as I build the model. So what I'm going to do actually is very simplistic each week and build up onto it. This week, I'm yeah. just going to do the Goodwin uh, growth cycle model. So we're going to yep. have constant population, constant productivity, a simple um, linear wage function. And yep. we're going to assume that all profits are invested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so, you guys, um, you guys can keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. It's great so, to have those assumptions. Hey, Steve. This, this is the causal uh, analysis that uh, Douglas is talking about. Like you, you've got people have taken a statistical approach, and they're pretty much Taleb's approach, but aware of you know uh, complex systems and nonlinearity, and then saying you, you, you know, you can't make money, but there's going to uh, on, on the overall run of things, but you can make large amounts of money when there's a serious break. Whereas the Douglas was saying, well, if you understand the actual causal structure, and that's what he's got out of both my work and combining that with MMT, then you can say uh, where things are likely to go uh, with, 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 with the continuation of existing trends. Mm -hmm. And so you can make money out of it in a way that Taleb doesn't think is possible, but uh, Douglas is showing that it is. Right, right. Hmm. Now, there's course, a bit of an argument going on in the discussion over there. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know who's actually having the fight there, but it looks like a bit of a fight has broken out in the in the discussion. <laughs> <clears throat> and somebody asked about the Canadian housing market. I'm actually going to be putting out a a, a rabble, which is my my uh, data uh, software for data analysis. Uh, on housing markets in general, using the most recent BIS data that came out last week. And I was, I was trying to have a go at it um, last week, but we've got serious um, fatal bugs in, in, in Ravel, uh, which have stopped me doing that. So I'm just waiting for the next version of Ravel before I try to go through the BIS data and talk about the trends in housing markets and so on around the world. But it is looking, I mean, you know, housing markets are still falling. I think that's that's where the rising interest rates are going to have the opposite effect to what Douglas was talking about. He's looking about government interest rates increasing the amount of money that people who own um, uh, bonds are receiving 
and that's a boost for the economy. But at the same time, because you have the um, interest rates for the mortgage market and the uh, margin debt market being based on a markup on on uh, reserve rates, you know, central bank rates, then that's likely to under, that could undermine the uh, the finance market and of course falling asset prices, and that itself will feed back into interest rate decisions. So I think we're in for some fun times pretty soon on, on that front, given how much central banks will put up interest rates and they're continuing to do it. So, um, you know, I expect a break to occur that way in terms of asset market valuation. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really, I, I'm really into making sure units are correct doing system dynamics. I know Steve doesn't focus so much on that because it takes away from the actual uh, easy logic of the Goodwin cycle model, but it's always good practice to make sure your units are correct. That way, when you're expanding your model, you don't do any stupid mathematical things. So um, you can't really see off the screen, but I had to adjust some of the units to make sure the logic, right? So uh, capital is obviously a stock of dollars. The capital output ratio is through time, so it's year. Um, that gives you your output, which is dollars per year. Then you have your productivity variable, which is dollars per person per year, which gives you your labor, which is a unit mm -hmm. of person. So that's kind of why I went slow there. I made a few mistakes. Um, so you guys can just carry on, and I'll try to get this done in a timely manner so it's not boring. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um, I didn't use units because originally when we first started adding them to the program, they were unstable. They did cause all sorts of errors. So I got out of the habit. But unit and uh, unit analysis is one of the most important things you can do in dynamics. So I really have to start forcing myself to start using units as well. I also don't like the N minus, you know, N minus, N, N to the power of minus one type way that units are shown. I'd prefer to have it, you know, showing um um, uh, you know, labor divided by population, uh, as divide by signs rather than the minus one turning up there. So if you look at the N, yeah, N, N is dominated in person, and you've got L, which is dominated in person. So you divide the two, you're going to get a ratio, and that's going to come out as a pure, a pure number. So that that's the, uh, of course, if you have something, um, false in your unitary logic, then you're going to get a crazy set of units coming out of it, like neoclassical economists have all the time, but they don't actually mm. understand why it matters. Yeah, that's uh, something I hope we uh, figure out too with the units is getting rid of the hat and minus one and yeah. identif identifying it with a per year or whatever's applicable and have it automatically um, do that. Um, yeah, again, that's the sort of thing I'd like to use funding for to actually enable that to happen. Uh, like a potato sack. We've got, potato, we've got potato peels for brains turning up here. <laughs> oh, potato. Oh, well, let's see what's going. On. What's what's going on here in the? No, the don't chat. worry about it. I mean, I'll wait till he comes back and abuses me again. This is uh, being abused um, by a neoclassical and Austrian economist really is water off my back. Up a duck's yeah. back. Yeah. It, eventually, it's just. It just becomes irrelevant noise, anyways. Mm, mm, mm. Um, what do we want? We want a slope. Oh. Well, I think I should be saying we should be saying something, but I don't know what yeah. to say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I think we watch watch Ty build the model. Yeah. Okay. I'm fine with that. Um, yeah. So right now I'm building a linear function. And in, in Mince, uh, this is incredibly hard to do this um, without hearing a conversation or not talking myself. So I'll just talk myself. Yeah, talk your way um, through the model for the better thing if you do it. Try not to uh, um, mess up here while I'm talking. So I'm going to create a simple uh, linear function here, basically say, showing the slope of the change and the minimum um, of when the wage changes here, and it'll become apparent um, in a second. Uh, and again, it kind of sucks that you can't see what I'm typing here. But mm. right now, I'm going to say that the wage will change when employment is at 65%. Um, 
And then I'll need, we'll pick, we'll go like Steve does. Yeah, Lambda. Yeah. Lambda. Or... But you're losing a, missing a B, the D there. Yeah, you got to type it in. Good. Oh, uh, wrong way around. Yeah. Got huge pressure here when Steve's watching me hey. do it, do anything. The pressure is on. I can do this with my eyes closed, but when Steve's here watching, I got to make sure everything's right or I'm fucked. I'm fucked in front of my mentor, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Hey, hey, uh, hey, hey, Ty, do you notice that uh, that lambda, that BD, the, uh, <laughs> is for our BD oh. consulting? Oh, maybe we sh should integrate. Should something. Something. Yeah, Lambda. let's get that Greek symbol in there. Yeah, um, I as, like that idea. Yeah, that would be uh, very, very interesting um, to add. I've seen that somewhere else. Um, I can't remember what it was. Um, but anyway, well, to, to be continued. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, just. <laughs> So what what are you thinking now with this? What you, okay. Uh, well, I actually, I might I might leave you guys to it. So I did, Tim doesn't feel so intimidated. I've got a blog post to put up and a couple of blog posts to write over here. So I'll go and get those done before um, uh, so, my tummy starts to grumble too much. So good to see well, you all, and I'll see you um, see you next well, week. Well, okay. it's good good to see you. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, bye guys. So, well, I, tr I tried to build a model. The, the problem with building a model live is I can't really talk and interact um, mm -hmm. with. So if I don't have uh, you guys talking, we can't do it. We can't actually do this. Um, it's impossible. We'll lose all our guests. We'll be bored as fuck watching a variable go, go up, um, you know, one at a time. Uh, I want to know what the guests over here what did you guys what do you think of douglas is he not a smart motherfucker i'm gonna swear because um we're live and the algorithm won't catch it and i want to do a little bit of testing to see if we're punished uh later on in views so i'm swearing a little more today one because that's naturally how i am um my wife would attest to that um and two again <laughs> I want to test the algorithm. I want to see if it has a huge impact because it does pick up and transcribe every word. Um, but what did you guys think of Douglas? Is he not? Is he not the uh, man? Uh, post it in the comments. Also, after the show, make sure because this helps with the algorithm too. And Steve and I, and even sometimes Dan, we will reply to the comments underneath the video. So that really helps the algorithm. If you put in positive comments saying, "Oh, this was a good show." Um, you can also put in your critiques. Just try to do it um, nicely. Um, uh, just not because I'm worried that the critiques are wrong because I want to grow the show and I want to make it better. Um, but they they look ugly for the algorithm and I'll downvote it if it's ugly. I'll literally press the thumbs down button. <laughs> But if you do have critiques along with thanks for having the show, et cetera, et cetera, you know, Dan will address it. I will address it. Steve will address it. We do a lot of interacting on um, all the comments that that happened throughout the week after the show is aired. So make sure you do that. Make sure you hit the like button. I'll bring up our top chatters from last week. I am doing this a few times throughout the show. So we have Ghost on the Half Shelf. And I got to say these slowly because they're such odd names. Botched Mandela. Um, Call Me John. I like that one. Wesley. We got Lana Dell. Mark Fabian. Web Freaks. Greg Roast. Uh, Ogham the Bold. And, and here's the, my favorite one. Man in a Pit. Uh, we really appreciate you having you each week. We're going to we're going to have that list every week. I can only because Restream only gives me the data on the top 10 chatters. I, I can't really I don't really know who the other chatters are without going into Steve's actual YouTube account, which I could do, but it's a lot of work. So I'm just taking the top 10. We really appreciate having you guys on. As you can see, each week our show is growing. I even get to make fancy little graphs um, and our lines going up. Hopefully that line goes up again. Daniel, how's planks yes. up going? 
Oh, it's going great. I mean, you know, we're always, we should have, we, we should have a, a series, I think, about using chat GPT and artificial intelligence. And, you know, there's so much hype around that uh, on the internet right now. And there's kind of um, like it's being portrayed in the, in, in marketing as something that's negative or bad. Right. And, and I don't, I like to always explore the good in something that's coming out. Right. So how can a writer use it? Um, how can uh, we put out better content? How can we create better content? And I think that if you experiment with those tools, there's ways to use them efficiently. And that's the image generators or, um, you know, the, a the AI uh, characters, you know, we've, we've played with a little bit with that on our show, right? On the show with, with AI talking heads and stuff. So it's just interesting to see that part of the technology kind of infiltrate into into um okay so i space. which was um steve referring to potato sack as the troll <laughs> yeah i think yeah uh will mmt allow us to get boosters to more so, people so here's the thing is i often i'm on twitter and i'll see the stupidest comment i've ever seen and i see a lot of stupid comments every every day on twitter um I don't see a lot of stupid comments on our our our, our chat feed. This thing here, because we have a really good group of smart people that view our show, and I love having them. But potato sack, that is the stupidest comment I've seen on this show. Really, <laughs> that's the stupidest shit I've ever seen. Like, I don't know where your logic, how your brain puts this together. I'm assuming you watch Jesse Ventura uh, conspiracy theories. Um, our country, what the hell's going on with our country? I suggest you actually just tune into that show. Um, you'll probably find it more entertaining because you won't find any entertainment to kind of elicit those conspiracy theories that you have going on in your mind. But hey, thanks for watching. It helps boost the algorithm. We, we'll take anything we can get. Um, what else do we have here? Let's go through some. Oh, potato sack. I didn't notice this. Well, good for you, Potato Sack. You, you you do know how to spell. I've seen some trolls that don't know how to spell. So at least Potato Sack can spell. Um, let's see what else do we got here. Um, um, I wanted to see. I like that jo Josh. Thanks for uh, coming in. from e Now, Josh is from the uh, MMT Macro Trader Show. Um, this guy right here, um, so a WWE fan. I hope you like Stone Cold Steve Austin from 20 years ago, because that, that's what I, when I watched WWE or WWF at the time, it was all about The Rock and Stone Cold. I, I love that era. I'm really glad you came on the show. We're kind of just winding things down here. Um, you know, this is kind of the off the rail um, time in our show. Uh, what else do we have? We got, of course, we have um, Ghost. Um, on the half shelf um oh if you need a break i thought about going on mastodon is the problem is is i i hate i have linkedin and i have twitter and i have youtube and like it gets overwhelming because i do a lot of promotionals through my social media it gets it gets overwhelming trying to figure out which one i should use I will use mastodon if it gets a little bit bigger and i can have a reach um but that means i have to accumulate followers but i have thought about it and a lot of other people have suggested it so if i do go on mastodon um we'll have to connect with each other because i'm going to need some followers um so we'll we'll get to that i'm just going through the comments here um what do we have um a lot of potato sacks since the after show started um, oh, I see what Steve was talking about. What an idiot. <laughs> Wait, what did, oh, what here we go. It? Here we go. MMT is evil. I don't know if he knows what MMT is, right? It's just a simple way to look at the uh, uh, economy using stock flow consistent methods. Uh, I don't know where he gets MMT is evil. Um, We've got uh, Tom who joined us. He might not be around anymore, but Tom, thanks for joining in. Uh, you are one of the people we love having on the show. Um, let's see what else we got. 
We've got, okay, let's see. I haven't read it. I'm just going to put it up. Does MMT face resistance because it challenges social concepts, um, uh, e.g. your taxes don't pay for anything? Uh, that's potentially disruptive. Taxes is thus a deeply political issue whose wealth gets destroyed. Now, funny enough, I have some of some issues with MMT vernacular. I don't like um, the word destroyed because that's not technically, technically that's not what's happening. The reserves that um, ultimately come from the banks and go into the um, treasury account don't get destroyed, but they are created via government spending. So I, I don't like some of the vernacular. Um, it's Here's the thing, when, when money moves from banking reserves, so within the banking system, and this is on the central bank ledger, and goes into the treasury, which is also on the central bank ledger, the liability side, um, it stops getting counted as base money, but it doesn't get deleted. That accounting doesn't get deleted. So a portion of your taxes does get spent on new government projects. It's not necessary. The government can just issue, uh, the, the treasury can just issue treasuries. And treasuries are essentially money. So when they create them, uh, the central bank, uh, or pardon me, the banking sector will buy them up. If the banking sector, which is reserves, doesn't have the amount of reserves, guess what the central bank does? It buys assets, creating reserves. And this is where money creation starts from government spending. Um, so that the primary dealers, which are bankers, are able to buy these treasuries. So... I get in a lot of arguments with MMTers because I'm a process oriented guy. In aggregate, what MMT does is it joins the central bank and the treasury together on, on one ledger. So it, it makes it simplistic so people get involved in the MMT movement and I like it. So it appears that money is getting deleted, but that's not exactly the case. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it's um, not tabs which is taxing before spending, it's actually stabs, spending before taxing. Because you have to remember, the, initi the initiation of government spending creates new reserves. Now, there's a process that happens with the central bank that's quite convoluted at, at points um, that makes that happen. But essentially, all those reserves are essentially... Minor some, uh, minus some small details created via government spending. So the spending comes first. Um, but when uh, the MMT community, the leaders of MMT have simplified it to bring people in. So without them being corrected on some of it, it appears that taxes are deleted. It's not deleted when the, the money's taxed. A portion of that gets recycled back into the economy that's that's accounting reality um and a lot of when i point that out a lot of mnts jump on me uh, but this is something that uh, warren mosler confirms stephanie kelton confirms this is a reality um so i i have my issues and that's probably the end of my rant um on <laughs> mft but i will say at the end of the day what it is to me um is the win godly type MMT, where bottom line, if the government's in deficit, the private sector is going to be in surplus. That is a first principle uh, visual look. You can't dispute that. Um, MMT doesn't say that the government can spend indefinitely. That would be inflationary. And nobody in MMT is advocating, oh, we can just spend our way out of any, any problem. What MMT advocates is smart government spending on productive things in the economy. Um, so I'm on, I, I see it on the neoclassical side, the, the bomb MMT, and it's just a bunch of bullshit what they say about it. And it bugs me uh, to no ends. But I also saw more MMTers point out things that actually give ammunition to the neoclassical and the mainstream side. Um, and I, I wish we could dispel some of it. Um, what do you think, Daniel? I think that's fascinating that you're, um, <laughs> like it's, it's like you're in your own world really. Right. I mean, in the world of economics and, you know, um, there's like, um, an ideological war going on. Right. I mean, 
there's the way that neoclassicals view the world and then there's progressives like yourself myself and steve right yeah. it's almost like you're just imagining you're discovering new information you're discovering better ways to view the world and then you're automatically putting that onto um like validating and testing that on ethical models the way the the economy should unfold right and i think i think intuitively it's very um pragmatic to think in that way because i think i think we all agree or or fearful that that we're, in, we're headed for decline economies you know this kind of growth can't continue indefinitely it just can't so what happens when it goes down so we have i have my dog in the background i'm running out of time here but we have a question have uh, i have long linger uh, lingering questions why is commercial lending not sufficient to put savings back into the economy because that's the premise of banking offset offsetting the consequence of hoarding um that's um let me think about that question sometimes uh commercial lending can heat up the economy and that's 08. um so I don't know if that answers the, the question. Um, uh, why is commercial lending not sufficient to put savings back into the economy? I don't quite understand. Like, I don't, I'm not a believer of savings per se. So what happens when people have income is they imagine if we go mathematically, we apply a time constant. So what it is, is your bank account has a thousand dollars and we create a time constant. And we say that every two weeks, workers are going to spend all of their money. So if they don't have any income coming in by the end of that next two week period, their money's gone. So savings is just money that an individual or a firm hasn't spent yet. It's a dynamic process. Nobody's putting aside savings per se, because savings is dependent on income. So I, I, have, I have problems when um, the economic narrative gets into savings. I just, it's something I don't believe in. I believe in income and you have income and you will spend it according to the needs of your life. Um, and if you don't uh, cure any more income, you will run out of money and there'll be no savings. And in aggregate, the whole economy can't really save like in the private sector. It's it's next to impossible. So I don't know if I, I answered the question. I wish Steve was here because he would give a he's he's the academic and the teacher and he could give a more concise um, answer. But it's an interesting question you brought up. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions here. Um, uh, MMTers need to read Marx. Yes, I do. Absolutely, yes. And in fact, so there's a debate. Um, will MMTers find, will Austrians find it harder to get into MMT, which like today's guest, Douglas, was a, an Austrian at one time, bless his soul. Um, or is it harder for Marx um, uh, thinkers to get into MMT. And I've always said Marx, Marx type thinkers would find MMT um, agreeable um, simply because of the social aspects, right, of looking out for workers. And I know MMT gets uh, vilified in, in the mainstream as being a capitalistic viewpoint, but it's not. It's, it's about looking out for the private sector. Um, so... I do think MMTers need to read Marx because what Marx uh, really showed and Goodwin did a um, hundred years later is showed the endogenous cycle between wages and profits. And that's something then Steve um, grew upon by adding a financial sector and using Minsky to create that financial instability. So absolutely, MMTers need to read Marx, MMTers need to read Goodwin, MMTers need to read Minsky, MMTers need to re, uh, read Keane, along with the standard MMT reads, which is Mosler, uh, Kelton, Randall Ray, uh, Bill Mitchell, 
those if you're an MMT -er, you got to be reading those four individuals I just pointed out but you need to go back and address other uh, another guy would be uh godly so what are you laughing at Wait, do we have do we have a comment here uh went libertarian mmt or marxist mmt um... respecter <laughs> <laughs> you're a marxist respecter you marxist <laughs> respecter i love it that's perfect great. i love yeah. it too <laughs> Okay, what do we got? MMTers need to read the money syndrome. Hmm, I've never heard of it. Is um, have you heard of that, Dan? I have. Uh, I don't know where. Um, hmm. Maybe I need to do some more reading too. Beyond Kelton, uh, and I think also MMTers should listen to the Beatles. Um, okay. I think good music listening stimulates the mind. So listen to some of the classics. Listen to some classical music too. I find uh, like when I'm doing creating YouTube videos and stuff, um, I li I'm listening to like classical guitar music, classical piano, usually really sad and depressing things. And that might be something that's in myself that I need to address with a counselor. Um, but it really stimulates the mind. So we should, uh, instead of just getting stuck on the numbers and, uh, the, you know, the economic thinkers, think outside of the economic realm and go into, let's say, philosophy, right? This allows you to think outside of the confines of economic thought, which most of it is mainstream dribble. Um, and then there's a portion of it which is heterodox, and MMT kind of falls into that heterodox um, part. But the world is bigger than economics. We have the biophysical world, you know, the environment, the amount of resources that are actually out there for us to employ, right? We have the way humans think, so philosophy. Um, it's important to go outside of the economic thought and look into those areas so you can develop your own critical thinking. Because that's what I do. I don't always agree with Steve Keen. I don't always agree with Warren Mosler. I certainly never agree with uh, Larry Summers. I'll never <laughs> agree with that guy. I never, uh, some things I agree with Paul Krugman, but very, very, very few things, right? Um, so I, I go outside of the economic school of thought. Um, so I, I suggest like anybody that's still watching our show, which incredibly we still have Twitter viewers and YouTube viewers. So thank you. Um, think outside of the economic th circle. Uh, but go, going back to the original thing, you know, what, what should MMTers read? I listed them off. Godly, Minsky, Keen, Goodwin, Marx. Um, Maybe even Schumpeter. Um, obviously, Keynes. Um, so John Maynard Keynes was stuck in a classical framework. So if you look at the old textbooks, before the curve supply and demand lines came out, we worked with a 45-degree angle line that represented supply, and then there would be a cross with demand. That's how they used to do it in the, the old days of old math. And... Keynes came along and he, st he, he started in, seeing... In kindergarten. <laughs> in kindergarten. Keynes came along and he actually started seeing the dynamic econ economy. And what he wanted to do with uh, general theory was show a lot of the dynamic things that Keynes has shown, sectorial balances that Wynne Godley really worked on. Um, but he was stuck in an old framework, um, the 45-degree angle framework. Um, but if you read, I believe it's chapter 17 of the general theory, that is the most important chapter. If you, the general theory is incredibly hard to read, along with um, Capital by Marx, incredibly hard reads. Um, if you're going to read the general theory and you're finding it hard, fuck the whole book, just read chapter 17. And if you want a synapsis, a really good synapsis of the general theory by Keynes, read uh, Herman Minsky's um, interpretation of the general theory. So he put out a book. It's called the, um, John, M John Maynard Keynes. He put it out in 1971, I think. Um, and 
he um, integrates his thought about financial instability with Keynes' thinking. Uh, it's a lot easier read, although Minsky wasn't the best writer himself. I would suggest if you're struggling with general theory, read chapter 17, read his papers called uh, The Theory of Employment that he published in 1937, and then read Minsky's uh, John Maynard Keynes. And that'll give you a really big uh, picture of, you know, Keynes. And uh, see what we got. We got Murphy. Murphy's in the chat. Murphy is not afraid to say what's on his mind. I always like it when he uh, joins in. Um, I'm just going through some of the uh, chats. Um, we've got a lot. I'm seeing if I pissed off anybody with my rants. Not really. I figured, you know, a lot of people would be telling me to shut up. And, uh, yeah, not... this guy says Marx has to just takes forever to get to the point. And I almost I'm starting to disagree with you, Ty. Like, I don't think we need Marx. Um, I think I, th I, I think, think he, we he pulls I... too close to the ideological and, and enhances a divide that really shouldn't be there between right and left. Um, I think there's a lot of parts that are just drag on for, I have to agree with that. So I haven't read capital all the way through, but I, t I want to be able to remember where the idea of the battle between um, workers and uh, firms really originated. And a lot of it was with Marx and that dynamic process. Now he could never learn calculus. That was his downfall. He couldn't learn math. Some people think he was a mathematical thinker. He wasn't. He was terrible. He tried to learn calculus in the later years of his life, and he could never achieve it. And so what Goodwin, after reading um, all of Marx himself found, was, was that cycle between wages and profit. And that causes our, our cycles in, in the business cycle endogenously. So I agree that a lot of parts of Marx now are obsolete. I'll just say it that way. Marx is obsolete in the 21st century. But there is a lot of critical thinking that he, he has in that book if you're really willing to suss through it um, mm -hmm. to, to increase your own critical thinking. So I agree. A lot of it... You know, it doesn't work now, but at the same time, it is, it's, it goes beyond economic thought and it goes into history. It goes into a, a social, a way of social living. Um, I guess for him, it was communism and socialism. Um, so do we need Marx now? No, because mathematically we've had people like Richard Goodwin and then we've had people like Steve Keen extend Richard Goodwin. So do we need them anymore? No, but for posterity, we can't just say, well, let's burn capital. Let's burn no. all, the, let's have a big bonfire and burn all the capital copies. Yeah, I just, I think that it gets, um, when, when the argument gets framed that way, I wonder, uh, I mean, it's not so much the ideology, it's, it's that the I ideology, for it, you know, it's like, Framing the God versus not God debate. Well, it's it's the wrong conversation. It's the wrong framing, right? To to you know to talk about. Um, and so I you know I look at this and I think well, there's there's a lot of things that Marx prevents us from moving past in a good way, right? So it, it's got its own dogmatic sort of characteristic to it, and I'd like to see that. Um, I'd like to see that, I guess, relegated towards the past, right? I think we're beyond it. We've learned from it sufficiently um, with other predictive models. And I don't think there's the need to bring Marx into the equation anymore, personally. No, I don't think, I, I think if we're trying to attract if we're trying to educate people how the economy works, like just a general person, yeah, I think Marx is a distraction. If there are individuals that are coming up to build on a new framework, it is important for them to read Marx and understand the evolution of our economic system. And Marx offered a perspective 
from that time period. Um, and to ignore what people, a certain class of people were thinking um, in that time period is to ignore how we evolved out of that time period and how we got to the next phase, you know, the 20th century and the real rise of, you know, capitalism. Um, so I agree, like in a general sense, Marx serves no purpose to the general person, but to a person like myself, he is a wealth of information. Yeah, well said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good chats going on. I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, you know, my wife only allows me two hours on a Saturday morning to do this. So we appreciate everybody that's joined in. I'm going to bring up um, our graphic and I'll create a new one for, for last week. But these are our top chatters from last week. Um, I will gather a new one next week. We appreciate um, you guys coming on and chatting. Even yeah. if you dis disagree with something I say, something Steve says, something one of our guests say, we enjoy it. And we even let the trolls come in. I noticed he's gone now because we shamed him. I can't remember what his name was. Such and such the troll, we'll call him. Um, you know, we won't even, it's generally we'll let that, we can block these people from the channel and from Restream. But you know what? Uh, this is a democracy and we're all entitled to an uh, opinion. Um, so if you think MMT has helped people get booster shots for COVID, uh, good, because we, we want to try to prevent the spread of COVID, even though I think we're managing quite well now in society with it. So whatever. If that's your belief, cool. Put it up there. Maybe we'll address it. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll laugh at you. Maybe we'll put it at the bottom of the screen. Dan, mm. Dan any final thoughts? Nope, I had a great time this week, and I'm looking forward to doing it all again next week. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that's a perfect time to sign out. We'll see everybody next week. Bye now.